Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Yep, it's the world's most dangerous morning show, The Breakfast Club. Charlemagne the God, Angela Yee, DJ Envy is off, and we have a woman who is running for Manhattan, Manhattan District Attorney. I think I'm going to land your name. Tahani Abusi. Very good. Hey, hey, hey. Very good. Good job. <laughs> right. A lot of variations, I, but I, that's pretty good. I hear it so much, so I figured, you know, I'd it's, be able to pronounce it. Well, they were just having a heated argument before you walked in the room about livable wages in New York City. And so we want to hear your thoughts on that because these two guys... Not just livable. We're talking about specifically here at ra in radio. That's what we were talking about. Okay. So you're saying yes. what a livable wage is for... Someone, well, someone in New York in general to be able to pay their rent and comfortably be at work and not have to have the, the stress and anxiety of, of finances. I mean, I'm a fan of, you know, 30 to $50 an hour type thing. I think that uh, everything has gotten so much more expensive from property to food um, to even education, extracurricular activities, but the wages have stayed the same. Uh, and people can't afford even some of the most basic things, choosing between trying to ride the subway and getting a meal. So it's pretty bad out there for some folks. Now, what about small business owners? Like, I own a small business. I couldn't afford to pay my employees 30 to $50 an hour. Yeah. We have a juice bar. So... Yeah, I think I think for smaller businesses, there's exceptions. And even for now, the, the raise the wage um, uh, legislation has carve outs for small businesses. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about bigger corporations that can do better. Places like even Amazon. That was one of the specific examples they used. All right. Well, let's talk about your background okay. and why you're running for Manhattan District Attorney, because we know your father, that was kind of the catalyst for this for you. So can you tell us that story? Yeah, so I am the child of Palestinian immigrants. Um, we grew up in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. I have nine siblings, and we had a small grocery store, and that's where we basically stocked shelves on the weekends, you know, donated food to the church across the street, the women's shelter around the corner also. Um, and we were a close-knit family. Um, and uh, around 14, my father was sentenced to 22 years in prison, and this went down in federal court in Brooklyn. And it was the first time I ever really stepped foot in a courtroom, and life as we knew it was just completely disrupted. You know, leaving our schools, leaving our home, no more dinners together, and our life became surrounded, um, or centered rather, around surviving the incarceration, keeping the family together, what happens next, where do we go to school, what do we tell people? And uh, for me, it was just such a big um, interference with life as I knew it that I just became more interested in how the power dynamic works. And um, that's why I became a lawyer and I wanted to be an attorney that could stand by families like mine, that could navigate the system, that can push back on things that are imposing, um, might violate our rights. Um, and. That's that's why I'm a lawyer. What, what started your mission on, on, on ending mass incarceration? You know, when I first started practicing law, I did criminal defense work. I did some immigration work. And because these were our kitchen table conversations in our communities, the communities I grew up in, the communities I'm always around. And so uh, as I dug further into, OK, well, how do we alleviate these things? There was just this automation of the system where even as a defense attorney, you'll get your criminal complaint you'll see the charges and you'll know how it's gonna end. You might know who the ADA is on the case and you might know how that case is gonna end. And even with the judge, we would have conversations where it's just very logistical and not really too much about substance. And I, and I didn't wanna be forced into that mm -hmm. premise. I wanted to be able to challenge why we were agreeing to these things. Why was this the way it had to be? And so I moved into civil rights work and policing was a big problem. Um, police are often the source of information, they initiate that arrest, they bring the paperwork to the DA's office, and then it's your word versus the word of an officer. Right. And I wanted to make sure that we held officers accountable, that we challenge their representations, and there's protection for the people. You think the Civilian Complaint Review Board, uh, what do we need to do with that in order for that to be something that's more effective for accountability for police officers? We need to take the final determination of discipline for police officers away from the police commissioner. Mm -hmm. Because they'll investigate, they'll make a recommendation, but it's up to the commissioner to actually do the discipline. Mm -hmm. And so... You get one foot nailed in the floor and you're just going in circles. Now, one thing I've heard you speak about a lot is when it comes to pro not prosecuting people, finding an alternative. 
right. right? So can you explain to me how that works and in particular what types of cases that would work for? Is it everything or trying to find an alternative to prosecuting for everything or is it just in specific cases? So what I want to do is, this is my background as civil rights attorney, is look at this from all sides, right? We want to move away from that knee-jerk, prosecute at all costs, revenge-type prosecution and say, there are instabilities here that we missed before it ever became a crime. How do we alleviate those issues, right? Whether it's housing, mental illness, substance use disorder. Uh, maybe it's a domestic violence situation where people need counseling or anger management because even if you separate the family, once that case is over, people are back under the same roof and how we've ensured some things change. And so what I wanna make sure that we have are these alternatives, these programs, that if it's a substance use problem, we have quality treatment available to divert people, give them a chance to do things different and correct course. Um, if it's a mental illness, make sure they have their quality treatment. If it's someone coming into contact with the system for the first time, we don't wanna lock them in to this one bad thing and then that's it. Because you know, once you have that arrest record or that criminal record, it's permanent and Word. it will dictate your obstacles and opportunities in life, housing, education, employment. Um, it can impact whether or not you can maintain custody of your children. These are pretty big decisions to make and we're just making it on the fly right now. And so that's why I push back and I say, okay, let's move beyond just prosecution and incarceration. How can we make sure people can correct course, mm -hmm. that we prevent crime, and we're actually focused on rehabilitation? Yeah, I would never understand why they call these institutions correctional facilities, but they don't try to do any correcting. It's pretty violent. Our prisons and jails are, are not safe, and they're not sanitary, and they're violent. And so, you know, they say that the data shows that our brains continue to develop through the age of 25. And That's so, right. Someone comes into contact with the system for the first time and we say, we're going to incarcerate automatically. We hand them over to that environment. And then what measurement do we have that there's been rehabilitation or that they're going to come back out better than when they went in? Do you have a connection to anybody who's been wrongfully incarcerated? Like a personal um, connection? Yes. I mean, I do excessive force cases from mm -hmm. the police. I do malicious prosecutions, false arrests, false imprisonment uh, as a civil rights attorney. So that, those are the types of cases we handle. Do police officers go to jail for making false arrests or false statements or planting? Like, what happens after that? So um, it depends on which county you're in. I, I'll say that with some of my cases, I've gotten officers disciplined, terminated, or criminally charged for their conduct. Uh, it's not easy to have happen, but I think it's important for the district attorney to establish independence from the NYPD and show the public that no one is above the law. But um, in most cases, when we take the civil rights avenue, there's just an acknowledgement on the record that there was a false report or misconduct of some sort. But then it's really up to the district attorney to decide, is this something I'm going to prosecute? Or the IEB or the CCRB to say, is this something I'm going to investigate and take serious? Now, I see a lot of people advocating for you also. I saw Kyrie Irving. Yes. I saw Bernie Sanders. So what is your relationship like with, say, you know, a Bernie Sanders? I saw Snoop Dogg as well. How did all of these endorsements come about? They came all organically. Um, our message has really reached people from all walks of life. And so Kyrie came on board. He actually joined one of our volunteer launches back in January. And we had um, 100 and change people on it. And he was just sitting on there. And people were like, Tani, that's Kyrie. And I was like, in our volunteer slide, um, Zoom. So oh, I saw that. That was I pretty incredible. That. Mm -hmm. um, but he's been consistent. He's pitched into our campaign. He's shared his platform with us. Same thing with Snoop. Snoop uh, DM'd me on Instagram, and he was like, I'm with you all the way, sis. And I think for me, it's you know one of the reasons why I ran is because there are thousands of families and people that have shared my experience. Uh, we've walked in the same shoes, but these are the experiences and voices that are often cut out of the conversation mm -hmm. and are left behind the Manhattan DA's office. And then Bernie's Bernie. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I, I got a win to you because of Tamika Mallory and um, Sean King. And I saw Sean was very upset because one of your opponents, I think, spent like eight point two million of her own money on weeks. her campaign in two weeks. And, and I, I don't know anything about that. So I was just wondering, why is that a problem? Well, her own money. this office, the Manhattan DA's office, is one of the most powerful DA's offices, and we have Wall Street in our district. We have to hold Wall Street accountable, mm -hmm. and we have to be careful about, one, our campaign contributions, where they come from, but, two, make sure that Wall Street doesn't get a friend in this office, mm -hmm. right? Um, we've had issues with the powerful and privileged um, getting away with things, not being held accountable. Uh, oftentimes, they, they 
go in the same the same circles. They have the same donor, so it's a conflict of interest, mm-hmm. um, and it's a concern. And so, when we want to talk about having one system of justice where there is no special treatment, there are no favors, the money's a big deal. Mm-hmm. Eight and a half million is is not chump change, and for people to have that lying around to put into a campaign in just two weeks. There's, there's a lot more of that. Because I, I would think her spending her own money means that she's not beholden to anybody. Well, her donors, too. Okay. She's got a, a lot of Republican donors, the who's who of Wall Street hedge fund managers and executives. But also, we don't want to send the message that you can buy the seat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Of course, if somebody has, I mean, to be a billionaire, money is not an issue for you. Um, but that shouldn't be the requirement for people to run for office or and there shouldn't be a price tag on the DA's office. Got you. What about for yourself when it comes to donors? Have you had to turn down some potential donations just because of the affiliation it might create? Of course. We don't take law enforcement money. They probably wouldn't give it to us anyway. But, uh, <laughs> you know, um, super PAC money, um, developer money, um, things that we know compete for friendship in that office. But also we want to send a message to the public that we're not going to tell you to trust us despite us crossing the lines. We want you to know that we will be independent and we're not going to be bought or influenced. And, and you have someone in your corner here. You know, you, you are of Palestinian descent. Is there an easy way to explain the Israel-Palestine conflict? No. It's not, right? No, it's not easy. I think that, you know, it, it becomes a very sensitive topic very quick. Um, people have families there. Uh, we have family there. So it's it's hard to watch these things on the news and see it play out and be silent. Um, you want to be careful not to do the both sides things, but let's actually start identifying accountability and mm-hmm. do something about it, not just talk about it. And so I feel like it's always been a conversation that never really comes to fruition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I can never figure out what's right and what's wrong in that situation because it all seems so politicized. The right thing is always to protect human rights, to ensure dignity for everybody, to ensure it's an actual democracy where everybody can participate in, to remove any barriers to people surviving, raising their families, returning home, to make sure that everyone feels safe Mm -hmm. without exception. Do you think Americans undermine the struggle that Middle Easterners go through? Of course. I mean, especially after 9-11. And mm-hmm. that was no joke. And I think that there's there's still right an effort now to be more inclusive and to kind of repair uh, a lot of harm that was done. But it's it's the stigma that a lot of communities of color face. Mm-hmm. Now, I saw that you said that if you don't win this Democratic primary, that you plan on running under the Working Families Party. Is that still the plan? No, we're going to win this thing. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be our focus. Election day is tomorrow. Polls are open till 9 p.m. And we've pounded the pavement pretty hard since January. And we're really excited about how it's going to end up tomorrow. Is it ranked choice voting for this, too? No. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that, because that's been a a really big issue. We've had to clarify a lot with voters. The Manhattan DA's office, like all DA offices, are state races. Ranked choice voting only applies to city races. So you will pick one candidate tomorrow on the ballot. Mm-hmm. We are number six, and to help people remember, we're telling them think pick six. Okay, pick I got to remember that because this <laughs> is my first time having to do this, and it's been confusing. Yes. You can go online though, right, and see what the ballot looks like before you go, because that's what I usually do. I go online, look at it, so that yes. I know when I go, it'll be a nice, quick, smooth process. Yep, and I even saw people these past couple of days bring lists to the polls. Mm-hmm. So if you know who your city council is, who your Manhattan borough president, your mayor choices, your DA choices, uh, write them down on the list and take them in with you. Okay. What, what do you think the biggest strength of like the American justice system is, and, and what's the biggest weakness? The biggest weakness is we still criminalize communities of color to scapegoat for the powerful and privileged who get away with things. You know, we've made people of color to be the face of crime in this city. And that's why for me, part of my platform is to be tough on white collar crime. These aren't victimless crimes, Mm -hmm. right? They've damaged people in the wake. They've brought our country to its knees time and time again. Um, But we distract with low level offenses, which are important, but there's another side to this. There's other people that live in this city that engage in criminal conduct, but just don't get that attention and don't have that reputation. And so what I also try to do is really challenge the premise by which we're even having the conversation. If I say the word criminal, you know, what gender and race comes to mind? If I say the word victim, 
what gender and, and race comes to mind and why do we have those notions. And so when we're having the discussion about criminal justice reform and accountability, we have to also challenge any biases that we might have and, and why we feel more strongly to pursue one group versus another. And I think the strength is we still have voting, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Manhattan has had four DAs in the last 80 years. Every single Manhattan district attorney has been a white, white male. man. <laughs> and here we have the opportunity to elect someone completely different, and it's in the hands of the voters. So all the money in the world, all the power in the world, and you have one of the most important decisions in the hands of the voters. What do you think this means for women to win this election and be the first yeah. woman to ever hold this position? I think it's incredible because you have an opportunity to elevate an experience that has been absent from this office, not only in its leadership, but how we approach women in general in the system. Uh, and, you know, if we're serious about being progressive, um, if we're real about it, then we have to show that in our leadership. Absolutely. Well, Tahani Abushi, she's running for Manhattan DA. The election is today. We're going to edit tomorrow. The election is today. Yes, I'll be out there voting. So we'll see right. what I, you know, I'm not going to lie. I'm down to the wire. I'm doing my research. So when I go in, I'm just making sure that I can be n a nice, smooth process and I'm not in there trying to debate because this is the first time for mayor we have the ranked choice voting. Mm -hmm. We do have a lot of different people who are running. So I'm trying to make sure I educate myself and I encourage everybody out there who is voting to educate yourself as well before you get there. I think ranked choice voting is so stupid, by the way. I don't see the point of it's it. It's a little confusing, but it's an opportunity to give a, a first-time candidate or someone that doesn't have millions of dollars laying around or someone that is trying to get their name out there to be able to meaningfully compete and, and actually win. And it's a little confusing, but it's not the worst thing right. New Yorkers have had to deal with. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, <laughs> At all. we're resilient. We, we can handle having more choices than not. But I think, you know, it's, it's good to have a mix. And, um, you know... Every poll site is going to be littered with a bunch of campaign staff. So take the opportunity instead of to run through it, right, to stop and say, tell me why you're a candidate. Tell mm. me why I should be voting for you. Stop and take the time to do it. Uh, our campaign staff is all over the place. Our volunteers are all over the place. I'm at all as many polls as possible. So I always tell people, I'm here. Mm -hmm. Talk to me. Ask me questions you have. Let's, let's get this right. Because the next person we elect for a Manhattan district attorney has the opportunity to either shake things up and, and really address the racial disparities and hold police and Wall Street accountable, or we're just going to get more of the same with a different face. Well, we need that shake up. So I'm looking yeah. forward to change. Yep. Absolutely. It's kind of... Tahani Abushi, yeah. thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It's the Breakfast Club.